Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, here's the show you've tuned in to see. Thank you. Ron just came in from Durham, North Carolina, where he was signing his book in the Durham Bulls ballpark. Well, what's a new version of it yesterday? Kevin is just in from Montana. I don't have to tell you what he was doing there. We all know. Uh, we're here to celebrate Ron's uh, great new book, which, as we speak, is the best-selling baseball book in the country and the best-selling best -selling screenplay book in the country. That's not a combination you see a lot. Um, very briefly, I just want to say that last night, uh, yesterday, was a, a big moment in Dodger history with the death of Vin Scully. Um, we want to talk about him later. Both these men knew him and had some time with him. But first, let's talk about Bull Durham. Can I just ask about Ron's wonderful book? Can I just ask how many people in the crowd have seen Bull Durham? <laughs> how many have seen it more than once? <laughs> how many have seen it more than twice? How many saw it last night? <laughs> okay, that's me. Um, uh, Ron's book is, is, is fabulous. We were talking about it backstage. It's marvelous in um, two ways. It's about, um, it's, it's, a, it's a primer in how movies are made. It will be, as such, it will be read by movie makers, by film students for many years to come. It's a story of how uh, movies are conceived, written, financed, produced, cast, shot, edited, scored, marketed, distributed, and so much for it. It's a fascinating story. And for those of us who aren't film students, it's a wonderful ride, believe me. Um, the book is also about the betrayal, the backstabbing, the anger, the bitterness that went into the making of Ron's beautiful film. And it makes you wonder how movies ever get made. It's what Ron calls a pretty normal series of fights, lies, clashing egos, and bloodshed, all leading to, toward a funny, life-embracing movie. Ron, let me start with you. Ron, Bob Raffleson, the writer and director of Five Easy Pieces, died last night. And I was reading the book, and he, as, when I got to the point in his obituary, where it said he'd been fired from a movie for hitting one of the producers. Um, I, I thought about it at the time that maybe you would empathize this because, <laughs> with this, because I've been reading um, about how difficult it was to make the movie. And lo and behold, if just after reading the obituary, I came to the part in the book where you knocked down a producer in front of the entire cast and crew who pulled you back yelling, don't kill him, don't kill him. Uh, you wrote in the book, it's fair to say I went berserk. You want to tell us a little bit about the trials and tribulations of making Bull Well, there's somebody here who can testify that if I'm exaggerating, yeah, we had a disagreement. <laughs> <clears throat> it was day three of my directing career. And when it was over, I thought there wouldn't be a day four ever. Yeah, he, he uh, we were in dailies, we finished dailies, and um, he had told my leading lady that she didn't look good in her close-up on day one. And I attacked him, and I got him on the ground, and I don't know, Kevin, how bad was it? It was pretty bad. Wasn't it? <laughs> he choked him. <laughs> <clears throat> and he didn't know the word uncle, so. <laughs> It was a, it's a, it's a, 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 Ron's the kind of person you want to be around, you want to play for, you want to act for, and he's incredibly supportive of the people he brings into the movie, and the idea that a woman's beauty would be questioned by somebody sitting behind a desk from so far away, his, it, it, it's too much, it's beyond the pale for Ron, and he would not have Susan's confidence broken and, he, and, and two things happened at that moment. She was beautiful, and Susan's confidence went way up when she realized what Ron had done for her. 
He just wouldn't have it, and, it's, and it wasn't a ploy by him. It was an instinctual thing, and he's like that uh, for, for all of his actors. It's, he will stand in front of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, and when you have somebody like that in your life, you just want to play harder. You want to do better because you know that they're going to stand for you on your worst day and applaud you on your best. I, I do know that um, when this thing was over, it took a while. Um, and I thought my career was over. Uh, Kevin and Tim were standing there watching it, as most of the crew was. And Kevin turned to Tim and said, Cujo. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what they called me the rest of the <laughs> It was very good for getting everyone's attention, however. Oh, boy. The, but the whole movie was like that. It seemed like from the very beginning till it was a germ of your idea of, of, of what you were going to, what you want, had in your mind, till, till the day it got released, it sounded like just a terrible struggle. It, it, it was. Every movie's a struggle in some way. Not all of them. I think Tin Cup, we really, they gave us the time we wanted and the money we wanted, and we just played to the end, and I, I loved that movie. Um, a lot of them are struggles. The, the trick is to keep the fights away, f the struggles away from the cast because the cast has one job, to show up every day and, and be that person and put themselves into the part that they've been hired to put themselves into. And, you know, and actors, I'm married to an actress. I mean, they've got a lot to worry about and think about and everybody's got their own lives and private lives. And now they're worried about, is the director going to survive? And... And do they not like us, you know, in the daily? So, you know, you want to protect everybody from that. At the same time, you want the producer to protect you from that, too. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they pour gasoline on the fire. So, um, but that's what movie making is, sadly, uh, and too often, not always. But what was it like reliving all this as you were writing the book? Were these things you had tried to put out of your mind, and now you had to... Enough fucking time has passed. <laughs> you know, I'm okay with it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, 35 years ago, why, why am I writing the book, you know? Uh, the, uh, it did take me, I told you earlier, 10 years after the movie came out to watch it because um, everybody was loving it and it was making me angry to hear them loving it because it was, uh, uh, I'm always, I, lo I loved that it was successful because it meant I could work again, but uh, I honestly couldn't watch it without every scene bringing up what was going on behind the scene of that scene. And, um, uh, and finally, after 15, 20 years, you know, I, I can start to enjoy this thing. <laughs> Kevin, uh, there's a website called Kevin Costner's Sports Movies. And it lists, it has 12 entries. <laughs> now, two of them are about card playing. I don't know about that. One of them, uh, you've, you're the voice of a dog. Uh, but in your career, you've played a golfer, a cyclist, a track coach, an NFL general manager, and five baseball movies. What is it about sports that keeps bringing you back? And what did you see in Ron's script that made you determined to, to get this movie? Well, I will tell you specifically, I don't <coughs> go looking for sports movies because I've seen so many bad ones. And, um, and so I, um, don't, I do, I'm not out there plotting my career. Uh, in a way of, okay, I've done this movie, now I'm looking for this type of movie. I think just about the time you do something like that, something like a little Field of Dreams goes around, well, I'm looking for a big movie. I'm looking for a big movie. I can't do this little Field of Dreams. I can't do this Bull Durham, this, this, uh, this, this baseball movie where the guy doesn't even get to the pros. I think probably the magic of... of, 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 of of sports is when somebody can tap into the magic and Ron takes a, a, a movie and his lead character doesn't even get there and yet you kind of love him you know I think he you know it's the it's the it, it's the way he looks at ba it, and he chose to go to the minor leagues and it's the most beloved baseball maybe that's been made um, and it's and it's a formula in a sense in a sense, because it, it, you have this beautiful girl and you have this one guy you think is going to be with her and now she's going to go off with the young guy, but you know those two are in love. It's, 
You know, it is a first base. They don't like each other. Second base, they respect each other a little bit. Third base, they kind of like each other a lot. And if you get around third base, your romantic comedy happens. So we're not ignorant of the, of the, of the formulas that have to take place. But Ron messes with them all the way to first base, all the way to second base. He starts slipping in, and that's how you develop a chance to have something classic. Because if you don't change up the formula, it will just be a movie that's repeating itself on some level. You get to the end of the Bull Durham and you realize, oh, I watched a romantic comedy about baseball. But you really watched a guy ironing in his shorts and a girl who couldn't <laughs> tell him what she really wanted to tell him and somebody that wasn't going to make it to the big leagues but had a, an ability to help somebody else get there that really didn't have the respect for the game. Uh, so. Ron turned it into poetry, not comedy. And you just had, you just laughed at the kind of natural beauty that the screenplay brought up. And, um, you know, and it's not the kind of movie you can tell people and they think, oh, that's going to work. It's really the opposite. That's never going to work. And it's still around 30 years later because one guy said, I understand what I'm doing. You know, and, um, you know, you just, you, you can't make a classic if you don't turn things on its head. And that's usually what bothers executives more than anything because they don't understand how it just got turned on its head. No, 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 that doesn't work. He has to get to the big leagues. He has to win the US Open. And what you have is a classic. And, uh, and it came from one individual. Uh, I just was smart enough to like what I read and didn't want to change a word. That's all. Well, the turning it on his head is the key. You, you know, the tropes, tropes are everywhere. We, we can't, you, you have to embrace the tropes. If it's a Western, there's certain things we need for, to, to know where we are. And then the good storyteller keeps spinning them and turning them and shining light on the tropes from different directions. So suddenly the tropes aren't what they thought they were. Um, you know, a Western or a war movie. You go in and you know certain things. And by the end of the good ones is you, you know things, you've learned different things and forgotten the cliches. Uh, uh, and, and that's the key. You can't pretend they don't exist. Um, <clears throat> in a certain way, you, you embrace them and turn them upside down. Um, you make it very clear in the book that if Kevin hadn't signed on and been interested in it early, it wouldn't have been made. It never would have been made. I don't think so. And, no. and, and the, the, the way that he finally, that he was finally able to make the picture, I think you should make a movie about the making of the movie. I mean, it was literally down to, this, this really was down to the, the last we minute. Had, we had a limited time. His agents, the young one was saying do it, and the old one was working behind our backs to tell the studios he wasn't, and Kevin had issues with the other movie. All of, I, don't, I didn't know all of this at the time. But he was with me in the trenches trying to sell this movie and we were getting turned down together. We got turned down by every studio twice with him attached. And a he offered to go with you to take meetings. Yes, $7 million budget, by the way. So um, that included the contingency, the bond, <laughs> and everybody's fees and everything. So uh, we got very lucky. It's a funny chapter, a thrilling chapter in the book. with L Literally down to... Um, a review the of la the last offer. Somebody said, "We'll make it, but it's it's got to be four million dollars." And we kind of went, "It's not enough." You know, we don't need a lot, but that's not enough. And uh, uh, I went to a studio that I didn't think would do it because they had two baseball movies already. They had um, Eight Men Out, and Rodney Dangerfield was about to do. Uh, the Scout. So in, a lot of people thought baseball movies were poison, box office poison. So here's a studio that wanted to be in business with me and I had this movie, a third baseball movie for them. So I actually didn't even go to them. Didn't even go to them. I, Ron, went, we went I got to turned down twice yeah. just over the phone by Mike Metavoy who said, I got two baseball movies, nobody else will make one and I got two already and you got another one for me? <laughs> but I mean, we liked Mike, he was a good guy, but he had a good reason. You don't need three of these things. Yeah, the one guy looked at me and said, they're not going to watch it in England. <laughs> <laughs>
okay. <laughs> okay. Why can't we just be a big fat hit here in America and not depend on what happens overseas? Not, you know, movies are, do travel the world, but some movies, they don't in order to be successful. They don't have to check all the boxes. I don't know how much you all know about testing and scores and things like that, but when movies test in the 90s, everybody gets really excited. That when they test in the 80s, they're pretty damn excited too. Uh, when they test in the 70s, they're trying to figure out how to get to the 80s. We had an American movie that tested at 58. At 58. That was the highest. And got. we loved it. And we understood that it only checked two boxes. But we thought, we like the movie, maybe people will grow old with our movie. And you actually have to have that kind of philosophy. And they said, this movie will never play on an airplane. Ron said, I don't care if it ever fucking plays on an airplane. <laughs> Those are the kind of things I had to cover up for him. <laughs> uh, yes, we do care, but it should be every word you wrote. Uh, but what happens is that, that, that movie on paper is, is gonna go straight to video. But we said, there's, there's, there's a group of people, women under 24 were not loving it. Women over 28 were loving it. Boys 18 and they weren't loving it. That was the biggest audience and still remains to this day. But we trusted the two boxes that said they loved it. Why don't we make the movie for them? Let's not change, let's not neuter it down. Let's not try to sand it off and include everyone. And so yeah, it didn't play in England, but it's never stopped playing here. And it's probably made three, four hundred million dollars. None of which we've gotten, by the way. <laughs> I got a little bit. <laughs> he, he got it all and what, deserved it. What did uh, Crash Davis mean to your career and where does it rank on favorite roles? Are you talking to me? I'm talking to you. <laughs> what did he say? What, what, did, what, did, what did playing Crash well, Davis mean for your affection for Crash. And where does it rank? What, what, did, your... what did playing Crash Davis mean to me? Yeah. It changed the trajectory of my professional career. Um, that movie, you know, writers have changed my career. I've waited for good writing. And that movie cemented the direction I was going in my life. I, I know a lot of careers are built on if you can get in a comic book movie, and why not? I'd like to get one. <laughs> you know, there's so much money there, but I, you know, how people build their careers. I, I built my career off $5 million movies. Field of Dreams, Bull Durham, little movies. They, they, those same movies just propped up my career, so I believe in them. They weren't franchise movies. We, made only one of them and probably for years they've been trying to make us do Bull Durham 3 and 10 Cup 3 and we're off trying to make some other movie. Uh, we're probably, we're not in, in vogue with the studio, not because we don't get along with them. It's just that we kind of are looking for the next story. And they're looking for the last story. <laughs> you talk about a little bit about what, what a s sequel to Bull Durham might have been. It's in the book. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the most amazing thing is on this movie, you know, which we go into the book in detail, they didn't like it. We were shooting the movie we wanted to make finally, 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 and the studio didn't like it, and they tried to fire Tim. They were thinking about firing me. I knew they wouldn't because he would have had my back the way I had his back, and Susan would have had my back. They kept saying it's not funny. And what, how do you argue that? Because if you, if you say it's funny and they say it's not funny and they're writing the check, what do you do? You just keep showing up for work. They said it's not sexy, it's not romantic. They didn't think Susan looked good. Hello? And their final argument, this was within the first two weeks of shooting, was that nobody would believe that Susan Sarandon would, be in, would ever get to bed with Tim Robbins, for which my argument, I'm the godfather of their first, <laughs> firstborn child. 35 years later. Um, um, but it, it, those are debilitating, and, and he's been through it on his movies, uh, of things because you're going to work every day, you know, you get up at five and you go to bed at midnight, you're doing everything you can to make the best movie you can and shoot every scene and get every take right and believing and trusting it'll cut together. And, and you, all you're being told is it's terrible. Um, all the way up until we got it in the 
theater with a stu- uh, you know with a some kind of a rough cut, and audiences laughed and clapped. That was the first time. That was the only f- good feedback we ever had in the movie, except sort of the mutual support that I like what we're doing. You like what we're doing? Yeah. Any ideas? Um, One of the things you say is that the cast pulled the movie off, and we can't think of Bull Durham today without Kevin Costner and Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon. It was magical. And yet, through the entire movie, uh, one of the producers didn't want to hire Tim and wanted to fire Tim. And even when the movie was out and a success said another actor would have been better. Yeah, and I I have the, uh, I think, graciousness to refer throughout the book to that person as the unnamed executive because... (laughs) Um, you call them suits, I think. Well, no, but there is one particular. Yeah. I think he's in italics, the unnamed executive, and I'm not going to tell you who he is. But. Well, the other story is is that Susan Sarandon is Annie Savoy. Yes. I mean, everybody loved her, loved it. It was a part made in heaven. They didn't want her because she, she wasn't on with something what you call the list, capital T, capital L, L of actresses. Who, she's in Italy. How'd she get the got the script over there somehow, and, and calls up one day and demands to play the part. Comes well, her, in and says, I am going to be seen. You're going to see me. You're going to talk. Well, here, here's the, the issue. The list it changes every day, and it's completely mercurial. And it's ter- terrible for the people like us trying to make up. It's also bad for the actors, because I feel bad. I identify with the actors. You know, I, I feel like they're my partners in the process. And I know how hard it is to work for up an audition. <laughs> and to prepare and to learn your lines. And you come in and you're on the list one day, you're off the next uh, list next day. So, um, but, and for some reason, she was not on the list. I don't know why. The unnamed executive uh, is what Who it was. Who wasn't on the list? Susan wasn't approved. I, and, and she flew in from Italy on her own dime. Yeah. And I told Kevin, I said, she's coming all the way here. She's not approved, but she's great. And I said, please be there. And, and she came in and she was great. Yeah, I, I'll tell you something about that. My, I, I, I watched something that broke my heart. I watched something happen play out and it was really, really dramatic. It spiraled down to two women. I don't want to talk about who the second woman was, but a really classy actress. And I like to think I know what a great part is. I like to think that. And. Um, when I see one. And Annie Savoy was a great part. And two actresses came in. And we understand Susan had a a very nice trajectory. This business is kind of ups and downs. Had this really good trajectory. Was kind of in this one area. This other actress came in, and it would be a really good example to young actresses, because both of them came in looking really good. Short dresses, little tops, so sexy, so ready. Two really good actresses. One was gonna walk away with this part and it would change the trajectory of their career. And it did for Susan for the next 20 years. Susan had an incredible run for 20 years and still works. But that movie, Annie Savoy, this movie, change that and when I said it broke my heart I knew that that would happen to whoever got that part and I saw two women come in and fight really fair and bring out all the tools they had to get that part and one was going to get it and that's a sad thing that's a sad thing to say and to, and then to watch Su- Susan because that would have happened to the other woman's career too but for Susan, she knew exactly what to do when she got control of that part. She also, after the audition, went straight over to the studio, and the book goes into this in detail, and Susan confirmed all this before I trusted my memory, and she went up and down the hallway in that red and white striped sub- <laughs> tube, tube dress that I, yeah, I still remember. Yeah, it wasn't very big. It was uh, <laughs> and she worked her way up and down the hallways until she found uh, Mike Metamore's office, and, and we were all sitting, doing what I usually do when I don't know what to do next. I poured a drink, it was the end of a Friday. Uh, he was with me, and one of the producers, maybe Mark or somebody, and a couple others, and we were, what are we going to do? She was great, but she's not on the list. And Mike called, this is all in the book, and he said, you know, I saw Susan a couple of weeks ago, 
And she looks great. Why don't we put her on the list? Well, she was in Italy two weeks ago. She was in <laughs> Italy till about four hours ago. Yeah. She, <clears throat> she played Mike pretty she, well. She played the hallway over there pretty well. And, <laughs> and, and she got hired that immediately. And two weeks later, we were shooting. That's how late in the game. <laughs> it's, it's, it's astonishing. Um, but, but anyway, the cast just, you felt really came together at, at a point. I, look, at Tim, Tim was an unknown, but I, I loved him because he was so different, different from him, different from anybody. And he and his agents had not told me, I thought he had no credits. He had made one called Howard the Duck. Do you remember that thing? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told him. It was the biggest flop of its day. And uh, I didn't know that. I didn't see it. And... Um, Nobody saw it, so uh, uh, it turned out he'd done Howard the Duck. But um, we did two weeks of rehearsal, something that it's hard to get agents to sign off on now. And we just read the lines and read the lines, and my rule in rehearsal is, you know, I come up with, you got good ideas, bad ideas, this is the time, because I don't want to rewrite when we're shooting, because I'm the writer and the director, and I don't have time. I mean, little changes we make on the day all the time that are good. You know, Kevin come up with the, uh, I'm getting, my favorite, the, the, the line I take most credit for, he wrote on the spot, the rose goes in the front, big guy. That was him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I think the kind of when you have a collaboration, you don't even remember that anymore. Yeah. You don't remember whose idea was what because you're so just wanting to get through your day. If there was a moment where that's what we wanted to do. We knew we had the Bible. We knew we had our theatrical Bible. We knew it worked on paper. We just did. When you read Bull Durham by myself, I thought, I said, we're, we're not changing a word. It was just that good. And so how do we protect this patient that can't speak for itself? <laughs> Executives, come on, they want to tell you what to do, and here's, the, here's this script. It's on like oxygen, and they're talking. No, it's not any good. It's not. It's gonna. Not, they unplug it, and the, the script's going. <laughs> You're talking about my ending, <laughs> and the script can't speak for itself. But we could, as actors, we had the director, we had somebody that understood the poetry and the violence and the vulgarity, which all goes together in that thing, and we just needed to protect this thing that someone wrote. This guy wrote, and when I read it, it just jumped off the page, and there was no denying what it was, and the, the job was really to protect it. It's like a salmon headed upstream. It's some, some kid with a treble hook, somebody with a net. There's, now there's a bear after me, and a fucking <laughs> eagle's gonna get me. It's a miracle that a salmon makes it all the way to the top, you know, and uh, it, it's like that for a movie, for a screenplay, there's th this, word collaboration can go too far. I think what Ron does is he collaborates, which means he creates an environment to listen to your idea. He does not have to take your idea to be a good collaborator. Oh, you don't take my idea, you're not a good collaborator. That is bullshit. What happens is you keep an environment where the, where the ideas can keep coming, but somebody has to make sure the picture doesn't get too fat. You know, I can't draw. So when I can't make something look like what I want it to look like, my line gets thicker. <laughs> if you're not an artist, your line gets thicker till you throw it away. It's no good. It doesn't look like a horse anymore. It doesn't look like a anything. So the job, we, 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 had, we had all the things that we needed. We had a script and we had somebody who understood it and respected it. And my job, even it was kind of new in my career, was to protect that. And when Ron says he was open to people, I, when we started doing that rehearsal, we had some private talks between the three of us and said, why don't we give these words a chance? Why, don't, can, why can't these words be uh, innocent until proven guilty? Why don't we just give these things a chance? I, I, just one thing, my job as a director is also for an actor to feel open to suggest ideas, but for me to say no 19 times and then feel comfortable offering the 20th idea, um, you know, it's not like, oh, everything you have is a good idea. Also, also, I say we shoot the script. We always shoot the script. <laughs> when I have it, then sometimes we'll play a little bit if we have time. 
you talk about collaboration, there's that marvelous scene that we'll all remember about the, scene, the meeting on the mound. And we all think they're talking about what should we pitch to this guy, and they're saying, no, what kind of presents do you think we should get you know, for, the, for the wedding? Which I'm sure had to come out of your baseball career. Uh, the, what the meeting on the mound, you're just talking about stuff. Well, anyway, it's one of the funniest scenes in a movie. And of course, the studio wanted to cut it. My, one of my favorite lines in the book is, the, the, the suit said, the scene doesn't advance the plot. And you say, there is no plot. That's right. <laughs> There's but you talk about collaboration. There's a marvelous line, Robert. He says Wolf. it like that too. <laughs> Robert, no fucking plot. There's a very careful structure, <laughs> and there's a very big story. Story and plot are two different. Well, things. the highlight of that of that meeting on the mound is Robert Wool saying, "Candlesticks would make a nice." Remember, everybody. He made that up, right? That was Robert well, Wool's. Robert guy. is who, who's, uh, has some back issues. He was dying to be here tonight and sent his best. By the way, he. Um, uh, he is a very large, over-the-top human being, and a dear friend um, gave the worst audition in history, I, 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 and I hired him anyway, um, <laughs> which is a whole chapter on auditioning. But um, Robert, if you're shooting all night, shoot his close-up at four in the morning, because he'll be kind of down to the rest of our size and energy. You know, It's sort of like, Robert, are you on speed? Because we used to take uppers on baseball. They weren't illegal to 2006, by the way. Um, uh, I didn't even know what they were. They were just next to the slum. What else is in that book? book? Is that in that book? You're going to love this book. <laughs> he, I just gave him his copy because he got off the plane. But Robert, I, so I, we were shooting that, and I knew that we'd get to his line, his close-up at four in the morning. So he said, can I play with it? I said, yeah. And so as the evening wore on, he would try a line and at about 3.58, he, he came up with that line, and I said, we'll do it on the second take. Do the script on the first take, and he did it in one take, because we never did more than one or two takes. And I knew it was in the movie immediately. It was just, <clears throat> that was the golden button to the scene. <clears throat> um, you said this book, the, the movie might not have been made but for Ball Four, Jim Bouton's great book, the iconoclastic classic of baseball that told us how baseball players really talk and behave. <clears throat> Tell us about that one. Well, I, was, I played baseball professionally in the same time Jim Bouton did, which 60s and early 70s, which of course is the time of Vietnam, which was the biggest thing on our minds at any one time. But it's also, uh, uh, you know, the civil rights movement was heated up. The assassinations happened, one of them at spring training, one I saw RF, uh, Robert Kennedy speak oh, five days before he was assassinated when I was in the California League. Uh, uh, the tension was ever, it was also the era of sex, drugs, rock and roll, acid, and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and all of that. Um, it was a crazy time to be making your living in, as a baseball player and, uh, and also a wonderful time. But Bouton wrote his book during one of my seasons and I fell in love with it and I went back to spring training next year thinking everybody would love it and everybody hated it. And it's called a tell-all book and that's wrong. It's not reread, I just adapted it as a possible TV show. And it, it's not a tell-all at all. It's a memoir of what it's like to try to play and make a living at this game that's very hard and, and, and to try to control something that's actually controlling you. <laughs> How, you know, he says, I spent my whole life trying to grip a baseball and I finally realized it was the other way around, the baseball was gripping me. Um, and anyway, that movie said, oh, base, sports does not end with a grand slam in the bottom of the ninth inning. It's about all the other moments. <laughs> and that's all I do. I can't, TV, TV, you can't compete with TV's coverage of sports. 20 cameras, high speed, but I can take my one or two cameras all those places that the TV cameras can't go. And that's just where I live. The Church of Baseball speech that opens the movie, Annie's voiceover, is one of the classic base, you know, speeches in movie to them. And I think a lot of people here could probably recite it. Um, I'm fascinated by your analysis of it because um, uh, you, you this is the one where Annie says, I've tried all the major religions and most of the minor ones. But you write, when you're talking about the speech, um, 
Is it a bit arch? Maybe. Is it self-conscious? Maybe. Is it believable? Not, re not really. Is, it's too writerly. Does it call too much attention to itself? It does, however, in the end, do what it was intended to do. Um, I shudder to think what would have happened if you had cut it. Or... Well, well, I was. that's the chapter of starting to write the script. And as I wrote it, I was sharing with the reader of the book what I was wondering when I write it. In, in other words, is this too much? Is this over the top? Is this understand? You know, uh, obviously, I decided not, and I left the whole speech in. But you know, his speech, I believe in. You know, I, I never was sold on that until he he gave a delivery so you know casual and offhanded and seductive at the same time that I thought, oh, it's going to work after all. Thank you, actor. <laughs> and uh, we, but I was worried about it because you know there was a way to read that I believe in speech that would be underlining self-conscious, self-aware, and he's so casual that Annie doesn't. Oh my, that's where we first hear. Yeah, oh my, my. Uh, which came from Dick Ingberg, the sportscaster. Right, uh, right, right, right. But um, yeah, those are just. Qu I was sharing what my doubts and beliefs were as I wrote the script in the book. That's all. Just to show how Bull Durham um, has resonated in the, in the outer world, you and I had a conversation, it's 20 years ago now, they, they were supposed to take Bull Durham to the Hall of Fame, where you were going to shoot it, you're, they were going to show it at Cooperstown and, and uh, have a celebration. Uh, Tim was going to come, Susan was going to come. At the time, you said you hoped Kevin would make it. Uh, there was a brief moment, you may not know, when the Hall of Fame became sort of a wholly owned operative of the Republican Party, a couple of ex-Bush guys were now running it. And they took it upon themselves to uh, send you a nasty letter saying that this was when the Iraq war was just beginning and to say Susan and Tim had been outspoken about the Iraq war and they were afraid that Susan and Tim were going to use this as a vehicle to say whatever they wanted to say about the war. And so you were not welcome at the Hall of Fame, your beautiful, beautiful movie. And I, I talked to both you and Tim about it at the time. It was, it was quite remarkable what, what went on. Well, he, Tim and Susan were happy to go to the Hall of Fame because they didn't want to talk about the war and they didn't want to talk about politics and it was going to be their escape with their children. And it was turned as, into a political event that it actually never was supposed to be. Now, luckily, Jeff Idelson came in a couple years later and everybody went up there and celebrated and showed the movie and it was all fun. And, um, but, but one of the things about baseball that I love is even in these partisan times uh, that, that are frightening, we live in, um, we live and die with our home team still. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like you don't know that you don't ask the person next to you who they're voting for or what they think about this policy. It's like, what do you think? Why can't Bellinger stop uppercut? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, a question that I still have, and uh, especially when you're getting thirty million dollars, you think you might <laughs> level out the swing. Um, so. Base, baseball, sports in general, but baseball specifically in this country keeps us connected. Everybody has played, at the very worst, God forbid, t-ball, which is a, a should never have been invented, but, uh, <laughs> you know, sandlot ball or little league ball or something. So it, it is a shared vocabulary and experience in this country that um, connects us. You said you were surprised with some of the philosophical, religious implications that people saw in the movie when it came out? Yeah, there were, um, it was very interesting because I pretty much got banned from my evangelical college for reasons I still can't figure out, but um, th there were articles written about this uh, as a Christian parable. Uh, there was also, uh, somebody sent me an article about it as um, an Oedipal, thing because, <laughs> uh, well, Crash and Annie were the parents and Annie was sleeping with her son, basically. And I went, well, that's, that's, oh, your Costa, that's a stretch. But, um, and even in, with this book, there was a couple of religious things came out. Crash Davis and the book of Ephesians, I think it was. I, I, I haven't looked that up yet, but uh, it's taught in seminaries, apparently. Um, I, I can't, I'm not vouching for any of the thinking here. I'm just saying it's, I'm rather delighted by this, <laughs> even if I don't understand it. Outstanding. Um, 
Can we talk about Vin Scully for just a minute? Kevin, you made a movie called For the Love of the Game in which you were pitching in Yankee Stadium, and Vin was doing the play-by-play. Now, you grew up in Los Angeles and must have listened to him. Um, we, we did lose Vin today. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think I was eight years old and I heard his voice and, and it was like, and Marshall just hit Roseboro in the head with the bat. <laughs> and I remember my dad and I, <coughs> and I thought, I mean, that was Vin Scully. Um, I was able to celebrate him. I was asked to speak for him in his last game at Dodger Stadium. And um, I didn't want to do it. Uh, I said, there's got to be guys that can do it. He goes, no, he wants, he wants Sandy, he wants Kurt, and he wants Kevy. He put a Y on my name. <laughs> and if you're a sports guy, you do that. Yeah. Uh, the first time I ever met Vin was on a, a golf course where I didn't play very well either, but I was kind of a young celebrity or something, and I just was out there, and these five men played. You usually play with four, but they said, no, come play with us. And I saw, who, I saw Mr. Scully, and... I didn't say anything to anybody for about three holes and about on the fourth hole or something like that. This voice said, it's your putt, Kevy. <laughs> he made me feel so comfortable. My dad called me Kevy. And um, of course we listened to him and I did get a chance to celebrate him. He called my make-believe perfect game and he brought us all to tears. He did this thing impromptu the whole game. And I thought, okay, like Ron would have said, we got it. And the director said, hey, Mr. Skelly, will we have you here? Would you like to do another one? And he goes, why? What was wrong? <laughs> and, and I saw what was going on, and, and, and I, I just stepped in. I said, no, no. I said, Vinny, that was perfect. And he goes, no, no, no. If he wants another one, Kevy, <laughs> they call me Kevy in front of him. Uh, oh, and, his, and the director went, you know him? And I was like, um, so he did it again, and he did it even more perfect. And I think the director was like, oh, this, th we, sometimes you're around somebody that's gifted. We've all been around that. Vince Scully was gifted. And uh, when I kind of didn't want to do a speech, I tried giving it away to Costas. I tried to give it away to Joe Buck. I tried to give it to all the guys, because I didn't feel qualified. And the word came back, he goes, no, Vinny wants you. He loved Field of Dreams, and he wants you to speak. And um, I didn't want to speak, but when I got there, I realized I had a chance to probably talk for all of us about Vin Scully, and that was what I did. So I was, we, we both, uh, he has a special place for us, and he has a special place for LA, not just baseball. <laughs> Are we ready for questions, Ted? The first question came uh, online uh, earlier from the virtual audience that will be watching this on the 8th. The question is, could you talk about instinct in filmmaking and how that has changed over time, Ron? Instinct, the filmmakers? No, no, instinct in the making of a film, judging your instinct. Well, I, I trust my instinct. Uh, I don't trust the people writing the checks, generally. <laughs> Who they the ones that question my instinct? I, I believe I I talk to crew cast about you know trust your instincts. Um, um, I don't think directors work with actors and actresses and try to shape lines. A you try to you try to hire the right people and you try to support them and work with them. You don't handle them. I mean that's a John Wooden lesson. You don't handle players. You work with players. You know. So my, I trust my instincts. It's just what do you do? when the feedback is it's not funny, sexy, or romantic. I don't know what to say about that except show up to work every day and do the best I can. So um, I'm good with my instincts. The business is a whole different issue. Are Crash and Annie based on real people during your baseball career? Um, I've certainly never met anybody like Annie in the minor leagues. Or, or else I'd still be in the minor leagues. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a lot of, obviously, a, a lot of characters and a lot of women I knew probably contributed in some way. But 
also a work of the you know imagination and uh, um, I certainly didn't know anybody that was sort of a post 60s 20 years later woman who was in love with baseball that probably combined a bunch of different things and ideas um, there was a lot of Crash Davises I knew there really was a Crash Davis who showed up. Well, there was the real one, yeah, who showed up unexpectedly. I didn't know. But, <laughs> you just uh, liked the name, and it was based yeah, on Yeah, I saw it on a record <laughs> book, and I, I wish my name was Crash Davis. I thought it was the <laughs> best name ever. But um, there was a third baseman in the in AAA when I played in Rochester, New York, in the International League, uh, who was four years in a row, International League, all-star third baseman, now, keep in mind, after AAA, the next stop is the major leagues, and in this case, Baltimore. But if Baltimore meant the next stop was Brooks Robinson, so he was there as insurance for Brooks Robinson, and instead of going to the major leagues where he'd sit on the bench and play occasionally um, and earn his pension and 50 times more money, uh, they kept him playing every day in the minors so he'd be sharp if Brooks Robinson ever got hurt, he'd be ready, except Brooks Robinson never got hurt. And he played his whole career in the minor leagues. And there was a lot of guys like that, and I have the highest regard for them uh, because they had this righteous anger, but their professionalism and their love for the game would always overcome their anger, but it was always there. And that was the inspiration for this character. Hi. Um, these days, filmmakers are very hypervigilant about getting the uh, sports action correct. They have sports choreographers, et cetera. What were the challenges back when you made this movie and getting the sports, uh, sports action right, especially as it pertained to Tim, who probably wasn't the most fluid thrower of a baseball ever? Well, hiring ever. guys like him helped um, a lot. It, you know, he did all the hitting and catching, hit two balls out on camera. I just didn't have the cameras to track it exactly. Threw out guys at second base. I mean, that was a dream. Uh, everybody was a player. Tim could play. He just never pitched before. And I'm a great defender of Tim's motion. I think it's, look, if I had a, I, I wanted it to be a left-hander, because you forgive left-handers anything, because they're all nuts. <laughs> and if I had an actor who delivered a pitch like Clayton Kershaw, you'd say that was a terrible, unrealistic sports movie. <laughs> and Kershaw's going to go to Cooperstown with his goofy move. So I think we do pretty good. And I think, you know, I think I've got the bar pretty high on that in all of my sports movies. Yeah, hi. Um, from a writing perspective, especially early on in the drafts, how challenging was it for you to find the balance between the love story between the characters and the love story to baseball? Uh, the baseball, I'm never trying to write a love story about baseball. and uh, It just comes through the uh, you know, out of the earth. Uh, it's all about the people and their behavior and their characters, how they react, what their opposition, force of opposition, what they want, what's keeping them from getting what they want. In the case of Crash and Annie, they're both in their own way, ultimately. Um, my observation in life and being an expert of this human error is we tend to get on our own way more than, <laughs> that's a bigger problem than people getting in our way. Because we, we, we have a hard time getting out of our own way. We know what we need to do, and we don't know how to do it. And Crash and Annie, you know, they, don't you think on page 23 they go, okay, I made a mistake with that young guy last night. You're the guy. You're the woman for me. Let's forget last night. Let's go. You would, there's no movie. So um, that's my answer. Yeah, th uh, this is for Ron. Um, being an ex-minor league player myself for seven years, watching, I've probably seen your movie 15 times, read your book, and I figured after 55 years I should come and say hello. You and I played together in 1967 in Stockton for the ports. I can't see you. Who is it? Ron Kotick. Oh, Ron Kotick, yes. And, uh... Pitcher. Yeah, pitcher. Yeah. Very... Very good curveball. You could have you could have called me. I'd have done this shot. You got a curveball. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted. I also yeah, wanted, you probably wanted the girl too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted everybody to know that you really lightened up on Dalkowski because I roomed with him for a year. He was an absolute crazy man. Well, and he, and he, he was, was crazy. I've written about Dalkowski. Dalkowski. Steve Dalkowski's 
is, is scattered throughout the book, but I've written separate articles that get into his demons more in more depth. And Alta Belli roomed with him uh, in Triple A. Dalkowski was, a, some say, the hardest thrower ever in the minor leagues, but he was an alcoholic, deeply troubled guy, and uh, spent 12 years getting, or 10 years getting to the Triple A, where he roomed with the veteran Joe Altabelli, 35 year old minor leaguer with a cup of coffee in the big leagues. And that was the inspiration for a veteran and an out of control young guy that led to Bull Durham, even though they're different characters in every way. But um, Dalkowski averaged 13 strikeouts and 13 walks every nine innings in his career. And <laughs> he had, there was a game, this is, this is all not me, because it's all in recorded. 21 strikeouts, 21 walks through a complete game, like 400 pitches, you, you know? Um, the, the stories are unbelievable. Ted Williams said wouldn't get in there against him. He took a guy's ear off. He threw him through a, uh, the stories about Dalkowski, who I finally met before he died. But Ron, it's so nice to connect after, what, 50 years or something? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Ron, I, I'm originally from Rochester, New York, and um, can you talk about the 71 Rochester Red Wings and what an amazing team they were, some of the players, and, and also Joe Altabelli, what a great guy he was. Well, I was lucky enough to be on what many magazines have called the best minor league team, or one of the top best handful of minor league teams of all time, 1971 in AAA. We had Bobby Gritch and Don Baylor and Johnny Oates, who later starting catcher for the Phillies and all kinds of guys. And Joe Altobelli was the manager. Uh, I, I don't know, half the team made the major leagues. Um, and it, it was, uh, we had a guy who actually was the inspiration for Nuke, uh, uh, partially, uh, um, although he it wasn't as mature as Nuke was. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, it was a team that I think was 500 at the break and played like 850 ball after the break and just blew everybody off the map. But it was, look, I was just happy to be on a, a winning team because you, um, the guys played hard, really played hard when it wasn't game time and really played hard <laughs> when it was game time. And mutual support, I mean, we could, we could close the bars and be the toughest team at game time the next day, and that was sort of a, a model for me, that a good way to live your life until you're a father. <laughs> Hello. Um, I've had this question for some time. I've been a big fan of Kevin for uh, many years, and there was always talk about you having the skill set to become a professional baseball player. How close were you to thinking in terms of maybe doing that? I was never in the class of an athlete as Ron was. Uh, I, was I was also, I thought a lot of times that I might have could have played, but you have to understand I went to four different high schools and as a, as a 16 year old I was five foot two. And when you go to four different high schools, all you're trying to do is just find a position on a team. So. When I graduated high school, I was not a sought after athlete by any stretch, wasn't even close to being the best uh, player on my team. But I kept growing, I grew in college and grew out of it. So I loved the game and had a high, high understanding of it, but I never ever put myself in the class of, of people who actually play the game. Uh, um, and, and like Ron, but I will tell you something that happened because of that. I, I saw myself, um, I didn't give myself a chance at baseball. And, 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 and I remember my mother talking, she goes, you know, you haven't, you haven't, you know, worked at that. You haven't worked at it. And I literally took the idea that I didn't want to look at my life and say, you know, I could have played pro ball. I could have played pro ball. I don't think that's the truth. But I, at the same time, I was starting to think about acting, and I hadn't gone to any theater in high school, any theater in college. In fact, 
most of the people that were in theater in high school and college, I thought were a little off. I did. You know, the ones in college were all barefoot and smoking bohemian. I thought, well, I'd like to act. I just didn't know how to act like a theater person. I wanted to act. I didn't want to act like a theater person. But I had this experience of letting baseball maybe get by me. Maybe I could have played. It's a wispy thing, wispy like the wind, not necessarily true. But when I thought, I'm not, I'm not going to let this happen with acting, just because I didn't, wasn't a selected athlete in high school, I thought, I can get better at this acting. And I actually used the moment of not pursuing a career athletically guided me to not let go of being an actor. It really had a, a that and we. I, 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 would, I would say when I walked away from baseball, the only way I could not have regrets is by having, replacing the dream. And the, the, I replaced it with the creative urge I had, which started out I was in the visual arts and it evolved into my love of movies. So I had no idea it would, I would end up as a writer, director, but I probably was more driven after baseball. Thank you. There's uh, so many to choose from, but for all three of you, what's your favorite line from the movie? Well, I'll, I'll just break the ice right there. Uh, I can tell you my favorite scene, <coughs> that bathtub. <laughs> you put a lot of candles out in that scene. Well. Um, there's a couple of lines. Uh, one is Crash's, one is Annie's. Uh, when, uh, when, when Crash is giving, when Nuke is going to the big leagues, which is a, it's both breaking Crash's heart and also showing that Crash was a brilliant teacher, which he was hired to be and it was gonna cost him his career. I'm in a complicated moment, but he was such a professional and such a, a deeply soulful guy that he's telling Nuke in the locker room what it's gonna be like. They're gonna light you up like a pinball machine. You gotta hang in there, don't worry about it. And then he says, we play this game out of fear and arrogance. And Tim turns it into a joke. I mean, Nuke does, fear and ignorance, no fear. And, but, this idea of fear and arrogance is something that I sort of part of my philosophy of life because we all have to acknowledge we're driven by fear uh, of the unknown, of mortality, of everything, failure. But the answer to that isn't to cower, it's to sort of steal up and choose your ego, and let your ego drive you, and that's where the arrogance is. So. I, I think it's wisdom from Crash, even if Nuke doesn't get it. And then Annie, you know, says when, in the voiceover at the end, when Nuke goes away to the big leagues and she's waiting to see if Crash comes back, uh, and and she's talking about the good things about Nuke, and and he was he had a gift he, uh, that the um, the world is made for those who aren't. What's the line about self-awareness? Who aren't, yeah, cursed with self-awareness. Aren't cursed with self-awareness. Um, that is a gift we can learn from Nuke. That is, why do we worry about what other people think? He doesn't care. <laughs> what anybody, you know. Um, what a waste of time to be embarrassed. What a waste of time to worry if you give it your best shot what anybody says. And Nuke had that. The line I liked was a Crash walks out to the mound and says, tells Nuke, don't try to strike everybody out, it's fascist. <laughs> Go for some ground balls, it's more democratic. And of course, every time Annie says, oh my, that was okay with me too. Well, the, the line of, about throw ground balls, uh, it's, it's uh, more democratic, that Bill Lee, Bill Spaceman Lee, famous um, Boston Red Sox, ex-USC, completely wonderful whack job left-hander, um, he had said that, and so I used it, uh, figuring everybody knew it was a Bill Lee line, and nobody did. And then I <laughs> met Bill like 20 years later, and I said, you know, he said, I love your movie. I said, well, I used your line. He says, well, I don't own it. Everybody owns it, because he's a total socialist guy. And I said, well, <laughs> thank you. I just took it. <laughs> thank you for bringing us here. Um, I like to believe that 
sacred people create sacred spaces. Thank you for your sacredness. Um, my question is, um, a couple years ago, there was an article that came up about like the struggles about minor leagues and like the struggles of someone being caught up. You have to find your own room and stuff like that. So I guess my question is, have you thought about maybe making a movie and talking about the economics of minor leagues and, and the struggles that that maybe players go through and how they're trying to like maybe unionize, you know, kind of like something along the source to bring more awareness about the struggles about making it to the show? I think that's a documentary. <laughs> well, they've, they've, they've killed off the minor leagues all but. They've cut, cut down by many, you know, there's only a few teams left. And well, no, they, there's still a lot. They cut 40 teams. That's the greed of the owners and Rob Manfred, right, who was right. uh, a fascist uh, in that regard. Bill Lee is right. <laughs> <laughs> but the minor leagues are on very bad day, very bad. No, they're, they're not they're, they're bad far, No, but there are far fewer of them. Is what they're 40 right. fewer, because, but that's Manfred and the owners yeah. trying to save a buck. I mean, <laughs> what I love about trying to save the minor le leagues is, you know who the two guys in Congress, in the Senate, who were trying to pass a bill to save the minor leagues, Steve Scalise, extreme right winger, and Bernie Sanders right. had, had co-sponsored a bill. Now because that's they had teams shut down in their town. If, if Sanders and Scalise can agree on a bill <laughs> about baseball, there's hope for the country. I mean, the only thing they've ever agreed on. Yeah. And our final question for the evening. Yeah, I have the pleasure of knowing Ron and his character. Um, and Kevin, you spoke eloquently about his ability to, to collaborate. Uh, is, there, is that a lesson you took from being a, an actor to your, your career as a director? Is that a sp specific lesson that maybe uh, you saw firsthand with Ron and that's something you apply as, you're, as you direct films? I'm going to talk to my lawyer here. I don't hear very well. I play a lot of rock and roll. What did he say? <laughs> about collaborating the way I collaborate on a movie and you as a director, what, do you, what is your ideas about collaborating and, you know, with actors, cast, crew, everything. What's your approach as a director? Yeah. Well, I, um, I told you, I, I have been lucky in my career. I, uh, I, I understood that if, if I was going to have a career, it was going to start with good writing. Because it's no, when I, actors will say something like, the movie's not very good, but I have a really good part. I always think, well, is it like to be a head flea on a dead dog? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I felt like I want to be a part of something that can stand the test of time. And I know, knew, I mean, I wasn't that smart about a lot of things, but I knew that's connected with writing. And, and so the idea for me uh, uh, early on was to just identify great writing and understand that, uh, that there's a collaboration there but the collaboration starts with that writing. Um, I, I really believe in writers. Ron, I said early, has a real big part of the trajectory of the career that I have had. Um, uh, I write. I am not the quality writer that Ron is. I think uh, you. Um, I think Ron directs like a coach. He believes in his team. He's a theatrical poet. He's a tough guy, he's all, everything that you see on the stage is exactly who he is, but, it, but he, he also is a softy. He, he has, he's emotional about who he does business with, and he needs a truth out of them, and he rejects them if there's not truth, if there's not a level of friendship. And those people, you know, I don't know that I'm actually answering your question as much as kind of would like to round the evening out with who he is act, actually. He's a, he's, he's a poet, and he's as tough as they come. Uh, but to, to be with Ron is, is to be on his, you are on his side. And he is in front of you. And you don't find that. There's people that are always ducking for cover when things get hard. Ron gets stronger in those moments. He stands taller. And you feel like you can do anything uh, when he's your director. When you have a director like Ron, I felt like I could do anything. And so uh, I wasn't surprised at all to see that Ron could take this, this, this movie that's still there. All these movies are trying to do it every weekend, and they're disposable. Doesn't mean people tried very hard. 
It means they probably tried really hard. But what do you do with a movie that's $6 million later that people will still come in the dark and talk to him about it? There, that happens every time we make a movie. There's a chance for greatness. There's a chance for it to have a long, long life. And um, my career is, uh, is as tied to him as it is to anything that, that I've done. And I appreciate him. And when I realize that he just takes this rough, tough exterior that it has, and he writes about baseball. He can cuss about baseball, but you can't. <laughs> he loves it that much. He can degrade it, but you can't. That's how much he loves it. And I, and I think that he turned around, and this guy wrote a book. And that book right now is headed towards a bestseller. I couldn't be more proud of somebody, a friend, um, to have that happen. And for you guys to come tonight and celebrate him and talk about his book, I really appreciate that because uh, he's one of a kind. He's one of a kind. Well, this has been great. It's been a great evening. I've enjoyed it. Have you? <laughs> uh, thank, thank you both for being here. It's really been great. If you love the movie, you will love the book as much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.